Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to this presentation on uh, free software on GSM smartphones. Um, this presentation is basically going to be two presentations. Um, the first one is uh, presented by me, and it's about uh, the um, what I call Open Easy X project, which is related to Motorola Linux-based smartphones. And there's a, a second part, which will be presented by Smurf on the HTC um, Blue Angel-based uh, uh, Linux-based mobile phones. Um, first of all, to uh, clarify any kind of misunderstandings. Um, in any of these phones, Linux is not running the actual GSM stack. So if you, if, you, if you think this is a presentation that is about the GSM stack on Linux, then this is not true. It's merely a GSM mobile phone that also runs Linux on one of its CPUs. So uh, if this is now disappointing to you, you can still leave and go to another presentation. <laughs> OK. So. Um, First, uh, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm uh, uh, working as a free software uh, developer, um, also freelancing, so uh, uh, earning my money actually off uh, free software related development for quite some time. I'm mostly known for NetFilter IP tables and GPL enforcement work, but recently have started to hack on uh, those Motorola uh, EasyX um, GSM phones that are based on Linux. Um, this is about the contents of the presentation. Um, so let's start with uh, a short disclaimer. I have no affiliation with Motorola. Um, the Open EasyX project has no affiliation with Motorola. Um, all information is based on observation and may be wrong. And uh, lots of the work has been done by a large community. So I'm basically uh, a newbie to this uh, community who works with the mobile, Motorola mobile phones. Um, this is partly due to the fact that um, most of the Motorola Linux-based phones, uh, at least all of the past models, have only been sold in the Asian market. So it was virtually impossible to, to buy any of these uh, here in Europe. Um, and uh, only uh, this model, um, it's the Motorola A780, um, it has been introduced to the European market so far. Um, it has been introduced, I think it was in September this year. Um, and uh, the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese market, there have been uh, Linux-based Motorola phones uh, for more than one and a half years now. So that's why there's uh, lots of, especially Chinese uh, developers who are hacking on this phone for uh, quite some more time than I had the chance to. So the, the goal of this Open EasyX project is basically to document the phone, um, to find out about the phone's hardware and software architecture, um, and to replace uh, the proprietary software um, that is running on Linux and the proprietary drivers, or, well, not actually drivers, but we will talk about this, the proprietary pieces that they have on the Linux-based operating systems with 100% uh, free software. And um, uh, there's a certain group of people who are also interested in, once this has been done as a foundation, to actually go and look at the GSM and RF-related uh, parts of the phone and uh, uh, look into... Um, whatever uh, kind of nice uh, uh, games you can do with these parts. Um, the project homepage is openeasyx.org. There's not really all that much about that there. Most of the information is contained in the wiki. Um, and uh, if you have any information to add, you're always welcome to contribute to that wiki. Um, as I said, uh, there's been a number of uh, Linux-based uh, GSM phones uh, in the Asian market uh, as early as 2003. Um, uh, that's the A760, A768, um, which look very similar to this A780. So it's the same flip kind of uh, design uh, for a phone. Um, and now we have the what Motorola calls the EZX architecture. It's A780, the phone I've just uh, shown. It's an E680, which looks like this. Um, so it doesn't have this kind of flip design. It's, a, it's an uncovered, uh, unshielded touch screen on the front. Um, but it's basically the same kind of hardware. I'm going to talk about differences later. So the E680 is only sold in the Asian market. Um, this particular model I managed to buy from a Chinese guy who has moved to Germany um, and uh, uh, buy it on eBay uh, here in Germany. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to have that one. Um, so as I said, A780 um, is now available in the US and in Europe. Interestingly, um, the GPS functionality is only present in the European models. So neither the Chinese nor the US models have the GPS uh, receiver, but the European do. I don't know why that is. Um, 
So what is it, uh, the A780? It's a quad-band GSM phone, so it works with all GPS networks uh, on, on the planet. It has an uh, AGPS receiver for, um, yeah, well, <laughs> location services and so on. It uh, has GPRS, Edge, HSCSD. Um, it's based on an Intel X-scale architecture. It runs um, a Monta Vista consumer electronics Linux. Um, uh, it has Bluetooth. It has a USB device port that can be, well, officially can be used for modem emulation and uh, mass storage, so you can access the flash file system. And um, it has a TransFlash slot. TransFlash is the latest incarnation of uh, flash memory chips. It's uh, from a logical and electrical level. It's compatible to SD card, but the physical uh, dimensions, the physical characteristics are different. Um, OK, so um, the E680 is almost like the A780. It doesn't have GPS. It ha has a full-sized SD uh, or MMC card slot. Um, it has an FM radio. I don't know why they removed it in the, in the A780. Um, and it has minor differences in the audio subsystem and a, a number, you know, a handful of GPIO pins are differently assigned and so on. But in, in general, it's, it's almost exactly the same piece of hardware and software. So actually you can, um, also the E680i is basically an E680 with, with a more current firmware. So you can, flash an E680i's uh, firmware onto the E680, that's what I'm running here. It works perfectly and you have all the features of the new phone. Um, I, don't, I don't know what, you know, marketing stuff. Anyway, so what, what did I do or what did the others do when learning about the device? So obviously the first thing with any kind of device I do since, I don't know, I'm 10 maybe or even earlier than that, I had to take it apart. So the first thing I did is take the phone apart um, take high resolution PCP photographs, um, which tend to be useful if, I mean, especially mobile phones don't tend to work when you disassemble them. So you have to put all the connectors and different PCPs together again when you actually want to run them. And then at a certain point, you want to find out what is this or, you know, what is going on. So you look at the high res PCP photographs. The FCC database sometimes is helpful. Unfortunately, most of the really interesting information that is submitted to the FCC um, is uh, confidential. So the full schematics and everything that have to be submitted by the vendor are not public, but you get, even though you, you get some interesting information about the hardware from the FCC database. Um, this particular phone, um, I mean, obviously all kinds of radio frequency equipment have shielding, but this particular phone, the shielding was not it was actually soldered on the PCB, so I had to unsolder all the different shielding covers, there's seven or eight of them on the phone. Um, look at what is there, the integrated circuits, try to Google for the circuits, uh, try locate data sheets uh, for those that are available. Um, also, the level one, level two, level three service manuals sometimes can be obtained from uh, websites that offer them for like five or nine dollars, you know, websites where the business is to, to sell service manuals. Um, obviously, the service manuals don't go very in-depth, but still, it's a starting point. Um, one of the things I always do uh, when looking at embedded devices is try to locate a serial console port, um, which in almost all kinds of devices that I've looked at so far was quite successful, but in this particular mobile phone, there is none. I mean, I can now prove there is none because I know well, I'm... I own the device, I have no root access, but um, <laughs> I own my own phone, isn't that nice? Um, anyway, uh, so there is no serial uh, console, but I didn't know that, so I was actually checking all the more than 100 test pads on the PCB um, individually with an oscilloscope by powering on and looking at the signal that ha happens to be at that pin when powering on the device. As I said, I mean, usually you find something that looks like an, a serial port, but in this case, there was none. Um, another approach is obviously to find a JTAG port, and um, there are certain, well, if you see five pins in a row, then it's very likely that that might be JTAG. Uh, I mean, as in five pins, not f five test pads. Obviously, you don't have any connectors or that kind of stuff because there's no physical space for it. Um, obviously, even if you find a JTAG port, it's only useful if you get a BSDL file or something similar. Luckily, uh, this phone runs in PXA270 uh, X-scale uh, processor from Intel where you can download the BSDL file um, from uh, the website. If you, if you don't know what BSDL is, it's uh, called the Boundary Scan Description Language, and it basically describes 
um, the boundary scan cells that are embedded for the JTAG debugging port. And by using the BSDL file, you can actually interpret the information that you send or receive from the JTAG port. Um, also, be aware there might be multiple JTAG ports for multiple ICs. Uh, so this uh, phone has four different processes. I'm, I'm going to show that in a couple of minutes. And obviously, um, each of them can have its own JTAG port. So even if you find JTAG, you, it might not be the JTAG you want to speak to. Um, so what we actually want is access to the OS instead of the user interface. I mean, the phone is nice. You know, you have a touch screen. You can click on buttons and so on. but it's a Linux phone, and you don't really have access to Linux. So a serial console obviously helps in many cases, not in this one. Next, network devices sometimes have Telnet SSH in, uh, available. Also, sometimes there's software installed that uh, is known to be exploitable. So this phone ships with CLIP 1.1.3, um, which obviously, I mean, anyone who has any idea about security holes, this CLIP has uh, at least two uh, documented uh, exploitable vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, uh, so actually you could, I didn't do that, but I, I think it is feasible to write an, um, a, P, a Zlib compressed PNG image, which contains uh, a shell code to exploit the library and to, to uh, basically, so then you open the Opera web browser on the phone, which links against uh, uh, Zlib and decompresses the JPEG image and so on. So it should be possible to exploit the device using that path. I didn't try it. Weird button combi combinations at startup uh, are also quite interesting in the case of this phone, because if you press three particular buttons, then you end up in a blue screen. Um, it's, really, it's a blue screen. It looks a little bit like a Windows blue screen, but that's actually the bootloader. Um, so by pressing certain buttons, you end up in the bootloader instead of the OS, and uh, then you can try you know, what the bootloader has and what kind of features you have. Um, access to flash memory over JTAG is also a possible attack vector. So uh, you can, if you have JTAG and JTAG is working, you can read out the flash memory. You can do whatever you want. If you manage to have shell access, you can just, you know, copy the, the whatever MTD devices that you have. Um, you can also sometimes using vendors applied flash programming tools, you can read actually files. In the case of Motorola, I'm not aware that there is Motorola software for reading from images. That obviously is for writing, but not for reading. Um, if you have a copy, well, then you just copy unmount, uh, unpack mount, and so on the PC workstation. Um, what you can also do is run ARM. Once you, once you have an image, then you can start running the binaries, for example, in QMU and software emulation. Obviously, there's commercial ARM emulators as well. Um, disassembling, you know, might be illegal in certain jurisdictions. Um, you can use new binutils, IDE Pro, and so on. You all know that. So what have you found out about this phone? OK. In short, it is a Neptune LTE-based mobile phone plus a PXA270-based PDA in one case. So this is actually at least two totally separate devices that are on one PCB and that talk to each other. But it's really, there's no, no real integration. So you have the real, the, the, this Neptune LTE is a chipset that's also found in non-smartphones from Motorola. So if you buy a, a, a Motorola Race or a Motorola um, E398 or something like that, then you basically get only the phone part and not the PDA part. But it's, it's the same chipset, it's the same, or, yeah, well, very similar uh, piece of software running on there and so on. The RF part will be similar. Um, so they just took an existing phone design and, and put a PDA in front of it and interconnected them over USB. So there's actually a USB port that is just on the PCB of that, uh, of that device, which runs between the front-end processor and the back-end processor. So the front-end processor is called application processor. It's a PX8270. It runs a heavily modified 2420 kernel, 48 max of RAM, 48 max of wireless flash. Who has heard about wireless flash before? Ah, yeah. Somebody over there. So wireless flash means that the flash is uh, actually bonded onto the same chip as the CPU. So you don't need to route wires on the PCB between the processor and the flash. So that's why it has no wires. Um, it's wireless. Anyway. Um, the clock speed runs up to 400 megahertz. Um, this phone runs only at 200 megahertz for, uh, um, uh, for power consumption reasons, but the Game Boy emulator that now exists obviously increases the clock uh, of the CPU to be, uh, yeah, to perform better. Um, so you can do that using software. There's a JTAG port, um, which has been documented. Uh, we have the VSDL file. There's a JFlash program you can use to flash uh, the, the, the processor. Um, 
There's an SPI SSP interface to PCAP and BP. I'm going just to talk about what PCAP and BP are. Um, there's uh, a 320 by 240, sorry, not by 200, 240 LCD display. Um, it's directly attached to touchscreen and buttons and also to the 1.3 megapixel camera. The baseband processor contains an ARM7 TDMI for the GSM stack and a, a 56620, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, DSP uh, for, for the digital baseband. Um, it has also a JTAG port, but obviously uh, such chips are not publicly documented, so there's no BSDL file. It's connected to this application processor via USB. Um, again, has SPI, SSP to the two other major chips. It connects via uh, using a UART to uh, the AGPS module. Um, and it connects the GSM SIM module, has eight megabytes of external flash and two megabytes of external RAM. Um, apart from that, we have the HEPS processor, which is again an ARM7 based uh, CPU that has again two megabytes of flash and RAM. Um, and it's again attached to using a UART of the, the baseband processor. So that's just for the GPS uh, processing. Um, there's a PCAP2 chip, which is for power management, clock, and audio peripheral. Um, it produces 16 different voltages for the phone. Um, there's a very interesting diagram I'm showing, going to show later on uh, on, on, on uh, how, uh, uh, you know, all these different voltages and so on. So that's already quite complex, um, especially if you talk about power management. Um, it handles all the mono and stereo audio, uh, stereo for MP3 playback and so on, mono for ringtones and the like. Um, it handles clock generation um, and as well backlight control. So that, there's two different backlights in the phone. No, actually three, two, at least two different backlights, one for the LCD display. The other backlight is the backlight of the buttons in the flip, so, which, which have independent pulse width modulation, so you can independently control and so on. Anyway. Um, so the RF part, um, well, that's not really all too much information known yet. Um, just the, the, the individual chips and their, their purpose. So lo let's look at the software. So the kernel has a number of Monta Vista additions. Um, it has dynamic power management, DPM. I'm not sure whether you've heard about the DPM patches, but that didn't really sound good. I don't know what it was. My two phones are still here. Anyway. Um, so um, there's low-level drivers for the SPI SSP interface. There is a PCAP audio um, driver, which uh, is basically OSS drivers for the audio, for the mixers, and so on. There's def vibrator, very important, um, which, you, which you can use using IOCTLs. You can actually control the P PWM of the, the vibrator, and uh, there's a number of IOCTLs for, for doing so. Um, the USB host port is attached to the baseband processor, which is in USB device mode. Um, the USB device port is attached to the port that is uh, the public USB port, which you use for recharging, for connecting to computer. Um, there's a trans flash driver, obviously, and there are three different proprietary flash file systems. Um, I'm not really sure why you need three of them in a single device, but uh, well, that's probably, I don't know, you need four CPUs and three proprietary flash file systems on a phone these days, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, the, all the low-level drivers are in the source code that Motorola has released, so there's no technical necessity of rewriting or re-engineering drivers. But if you look at the code, then there is a moral necessity. Um, so <laughs> the, the proprietary pieces in the kernel are mainly Max Klee, GPRSV, and IPsec.0. Uh, um, IPsec.0, well, yes, this phone actually ships when you buy it as an end user, it ships with an IPsec stack. So you buy the phone, <laughs> you have an IPsec client, you can make your IPsec tunnels and so on. It's quite convenient. Um, but anyway, that IPsec stack is a proprietary IPsec stack. I mean, we already have two GPL licensed IPsec stacks for two four kernels, but no, we need a third proprietary one because we cannot use an existing GPL licensed one. I don't know why. Anyway, but at least there's no reason for re-engineering that IPsec module because we can just use the free one. Um, it's a little bit harder for the Max Klee and the GPRSV modules. Max Klee is hooks into, the, into special callback functions that they have introduced in the USB host driver. And it actually does a GSM TS07.10 demultiplex. So uh, people who know about Bluetooth will have heard about that. Um, it's basically a, a multiplex of, of uh, multiple channels onto one serial channel. So you have a number of channels that go multiplex through one channel. Not, nothing magic, but just some strange GSM protocol. 
Um, so what they have is this USB line between AP and BP, over which they talk this TS-07.10. And uh, that Max Klee driver provides one TTY device for each of the um, multiplex channels that go over that uh, TS-07.10 uh, um, channel. Um, then uh, the GPRS works in a way that um, there's a GPRS V.0 module which implements a GPRS line discipline that binds on top of those TTY devices, or at least two of them, because you have two different GPRS uh, connections. You can have two different GPRS connections at the same time using that phone. Um, so it, it implements uh, this line discipline, which uh, also imp then it hooks somehow into NetFilter to intercept DNS packets. I haven't really figured out why that is or what the particular purpose is, but it, it intercepts DNS packets and does something magic. Um, and then it provides GPRS0 and GPRS1 network devices. So it's a regular network device, so if you have shell access, you can just IF config and, and you know, do the usual kind of thing. Um, I'm in the process of rewriting these modules um, to, to um, have a free implementation of them. It's actually quite convenient um, to, to, to do so because uh, Motorola has left almost all the development and debugging information in there. Um, I'm not only talking about debugging information of object files, but I'm talking about callback functions in which you can hook in order to obtain hex dumps of all the packets going back and forth on the USB um, and stuff like that. So it's, I don't know, maybe they didn't have time to remove it. I don't know what the reason was, but it's uh, nice though. Um, so what other software do we have? Well, this is actually, it doesn't run UC Libc, it doesn't run BusyBox, it has the full glibc, it has a full bash, it has the full file utils, it has the full, you know, all the GNU system. I mean, why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's an embedded device. Um, the GPS is not EMEA compatible, there's no serial device emulation, there's some proprietary library that uses the Max Cle kernel module to talk to, to tunnel through the USB, through the baseband processor to the AGPS module that attaches to the, the, the BP. So that's not, not very easy. The user interface is an embedded QT and the Motorola EasyX toolkit and obviously all the front-end applications are proprietary. Um, Java, well, it has J2ME, including 3D Java APIs for strange games. Um, but, well, um, who wants Java if there's running Linux on the phone? Um, so other applications they have is Opera, Helix Player. So the, the, the player can play, play MP3, uh, WMA, MP4, AAC, whatever. It's, it's a full-based uh, Helix Player. Um, that's the co-pilot uh, GPS navigation map and route program, and so on. Ah, yeah, well. <laughs> If you play with phones. <laughs> um, so firmware images is another interesting issue because, I mean, when you want to flash something of your own onto the device, then you somehow need to flash it. I mean, obviously, you could use the JTAG port or the alternative way is use the official flash, well, flash update procedure that was designed by the vendor Motorola in this case. Um, what they ship is uh, SHX firmware images to their service centers. Uh, I don't think there's any legal way of getting these firmware images, and they're proprietary Windows apps, which actually require dongles, if I'm not mistaken, at least uh, on, on originally, um, uh, in order to program them. So the SHX files contain lots and lots of stuff, uh, including a bootloader for the application processor, Linux kernel root file system, language pack, um, boot up logo, DSP code, cryptographic signatures, and so on. Anyway. Um, we have managed to build firmware update images that you can use using the official Motorola tool uh, and which do not contain official Motorola uh, software, but still um, nobody is able to legally get the original or uh, the official Motorola flashing tool, so we need to work on that. Interestingly, the bootloader is also based on a GPL licensed bootloader, so at some point we will certainly see the source code for this bootloader um, because it's based on the GPL licensed blob. Um, so what does it do? Well, it does GPIO and so on, uh, low-level initialization. Then it opens, oops, sorry. Then it opens a vendor-specific USB device that uh, you can uh, transfer executable code over USB to the device, and then it jumps into that executable code, and then this executable code um, will reconfigure the USB interface uh, to create a new USB device with its own endpoints, which then uh, transfers the firmware image uh, into RAM of the phone and then um, starts reflashing the phone. And then uh, it goes even further than that because then it needs to um, transfer some flashing code onto the baseband processor over the internal USB link. Um, then the baseband processor executes that code, creates special USB endpoints on this second internal USB interface where it then 
then you send a baseband processor firmware image from the host to the application processor to the baseband processor where it then uh, is flashed actually onto the device. And you can go one iteration further if you want to update the firmware of the GPS because that's behind the baseband processor. So it's like this bootstrapping. So there is a reason why flashing only works if the battery is fully charged. Um, <laughs> Interestingly, since the bootloader is based on the GPL licensed blob, um, there is support for a serial console in the binary, but it's not used. If you look at it, I mean, you can even officially look at it because it's GPL licensed, so you can actually disassemble it without having any legal problems. Um, so you, it's never, the functions are never jumped to. So there's all the different commands, the strings for the commands, all the code from the commands, all this there in the object code, but those functions, it's dead code and never used. Um, uh, but that's very unfortunate. So I actually now have a modified phone. I didn't bring it because it's very fragile. So I connected all the test pairs, JTAG, and, and uh, ser the, well, the new serial console. So I have, I have abused the Bluetooth UART to create a serial console during boot up. And I used you know, very thin wires and uh, you, uh, pull all those wires out of the phone and close the phone again in order to make battery and all the, the PCBs connect again. So I now have a serial console there uh, which I can use from Linux, from my own kernel, but which I cannot use from uh, the bootloader, even though the bootloader has support. But anyway, if we see the source code, all that is uh, the past. Um, so, well, yes, they have a USB device port, but actually what it is is an enhanced mini USB MU port. So depending on certain, on, on the values of resistors that you put either from one of the two USB signaling wires to each other or to plus, U, uh, the plus USB voltage or to ground, then you can switch that USB port into multiple uh, different devices. So it can either be a USB device port or a serial port or a stereo analog audio signal or a 500 milliamp charger or a 100 milliamp charger or a car kit either easy install or professionally installed, or a factory test mode. So either if you use 3.3K or 10K or whatever kind of resistance value, there's a special logic inside the phone which then reconfigures and, and switches all the, the lines. It's, it's quite amazing how, how much you can overload a USB port. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, analog stereo audio on USB is certainly something I've never heard before. Um, so the question is, how do we use all these configurations? Because officially, it only runs as a modem emulation or mass storage device. Um, but there are some number of undocumented configs. So once you have shell access on the phone, you can use the proc file system to switch it into different USB modes. So you can switch it from whatever mode into, for example, USB network. So it actually provides a network device over USB, and you can turn it into the phone. Uh, it, the phone even runs a Samba server. <laughs> yeah. I guess people were using Windows to develop uh, uh, software for it. Um, but it also has NFS modules, so at, at least. Um, there's a PST mode, which is the mode used by the phone support tool Windows application. There is a mode that is called DSP log, which sounds very exciting, but I haven't really found out anything about it. But well, apparently, it is some way to dump data from the DSP onto the host system. Um, there's a net monitor mode, which also sounds very exciting, but I haven't looked into those ones. Uh, either. So what's the status? We have a very good picture about the phone architecture. We have an initial 2614 port done, which has still lots of bugs. Um, we have an updated tool chain. So originally the tool chain used was a GCC 3.2. Now we have a 3.4 tool chain. People have worked on an EasyX OP embedded QT integration. Um, so you can coexist native Motorola EasyX applications with um, um, OP from Open Embedded. Um, we have replaced the proprietary um, user space Bluetooth stack that they're using with the native Blue Z. Um, I've obviously done NetFilter IP tables uh, modules for the kernel. So even with the stock kernel, you can now run a packet filter and network address translation on the phone, uh, which obviously is required if you're a NetFilter developer, then this is uh, one of the basic things you need to do. So I can now run a network between the phone and my computer and can NAT between the, e, uh, the USB network and the GPRS connection and uh, stuff like that. Anyway, um, well, there's stuff for uh, AF packet modules, so you can run NMAP and TCP dump. Uh, I've cross-compiled LSOF, BusyBox, Bash 2, Game Boy emulator. There's also a console QT application you can use on the phone itself, on the touch screen, in order to um, uh, access the shell without an external device. There's a number of to-dos. Um, 
well, first of all, get a full T6 kernel running, including all drivers and power management. Once that is done, all that code will go mainline. I'll make sure about that. Um, obviously, uh, we need free software uh, backend to talk to the Neptune LTE, uh, so you can actually make calls and so on. I can, I can show you dumps on how it, how it looks like uh, when uh, incoming calls are received and where, how, how to parse the incoming caller number and so on and so on. Um, but uh, obviously there's still a lot of work to do in order to actually in order to use the phone part of the phone from your own applications. Um, USB on the go um, should be working. Um, the PXA270 has support for it and the way it is connected to the USB port should also support it, but it is not, I mean, it's not officially supported and I haven't tested it so far. Yeah, we need to discover how the DSP log and other interfaces work because they sound so exciting. Um, and, uh, oh, they even have, they have very interesting stuff in there for debugging. So there's a module which is called AP log and um, it, is an, well, it basically has an LD preload library. So all the executors that are started are LD preloaded with a special library that redirects all uh, prints to standard out and standard error over the USB link to the notebook to the development system. So any kind of applications that talk to standard out will then redirect it over USB and you get uh, that information on your host PC and all kinds of interesting features, all uh, well, undocumented and, and, and so on. Um, native IPsec, a scum VM pod is obviously an interesting thing to do because it's exactly the right resolution and it has a touch sensitive screen. So it's ideal for running, uh, you know, Monkey Island and stuff. Um, obviously we need to work, merge with Open Embedded at some point uh, and, and, and get support, but yeah, that's some point next year. Okay, that's my usual thanks slide. I'm going to show two more special slides um, before I'm going to open a terminal window and we can actually see how the phone looks like, how you can uh, access it and so on. Um, so now the, the two special slides which uh, somehow have managed their way to me. Um, so the power distribution, for example. This is just distribution of different power inside the phone, and it's a power distribution tree, basically, all the different voltages and where they go and so on, so this is just power. And obviously for power management, you need to know when to switch off which and where and which individual part. Um, and as also, if you want to see, get a full picture, some overview schematic. So this is a phone, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm still amazed by it. Um, yeah, so, anyway, um, looking at the phone and logging into the phone, I've now connected it, switched into the USB network mode, um, I can turn it onto the phone, is that visible? Yeah, it is. Um, the font, can, can you read it? Yeah, I guess so. Um, it's not even a root password, you know, this is, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't remove it, there was none. Okay, so um, we can do, nah. for example, look at what kind of CPU it is, X scale, um, you know, and so on. Um, I'm now, I have obviously installed all kinds of additional software, so I'm just going to uh, run a bash two and um, so I get tab completion and so on. Just give me a second. Um, Okay, um, so if we look at list of processes on a mobile phone these days. Um, no, no, that's just the first, I'm, I'm going to scroll about this page wise. This is page one, page two, page three, page four, page six. <laughs> so we have, we have a multi-threaded sound manager with six threads. We have, uh, let me see, oh, the database daemon, yes. We have, here is the database daemon. So this is 20.6 megabytes virtual size database daemon. So what they do is they run for your contacts and addresses and so on. Um, there is a database daemon that stores in Berkeley DB on the flash file system. And that database daemon uses Unix domain sockets to talk to the front end applications. It's just like everybody would design a mobile phone these days. <laughs> Um, and there's stuff like, um, now let me see, well, the address book and so on. So anyway, this is an idle phone. 
apart from the Telnet daemon, it's not running anything that it wouldn't run otherwise. And um, if we look at, do I have top now? Yes. If you look at this, you know, it's like 45 out of 46 megabytes are being used in an idle phone. Doesn't do anything. And now imagine you start the GPS navigation application. And no wonder it always complains that it has too little RAM. Um, but yeah, well, you know, DLIFC and you need, obviously, anyway, a full-blown system. Yeah, from the, just some, some demonstration. So I've already mapped all the key layout and so on. So I have LSOF, for example, in order to see. Um, uh, let's see if somebody has opened Dev Vibrator at the moment. No, obviously not, but anyway. Oh, uh, for example, well, maybe I can make it audible. Um, oh, yeah. So it's just the Linux system. It has Dev DSP. You can echo stuff to it, and it will come out of the speaker. Anyway. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go any further from this point because there's still uh, a short presentation on uh, uh, the uh, Blue Angel phone. I'm just looking for the speaker. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Yeah, well, maybe this is the time to come up to the stage um, and uh, g give some insight onto another um, Linux-based mobile phone that is available these days. Um, yeah, so um, please welcome Smurf for uh, his presentation on the... HTC Blue Angel phone. Ich hoffe, das noch genug Zeit. Thank you. Oh oh. Okay. Kannst du nur 1024 das machen? Ja, das war Moses gerade. Kein Moment. Maybe if there meanwhile are questions for the EZX phone, we can we can answer to one or two questions while we get the notebook running with the projector. Any questions? Please use the microphones. Okay, I'm going to go over to this microphone, but uh, anyway. So uh, there's a USB packet stream between the Linux processor and the, uh, the GSM processor? Yes, that's correct. Uh, have you been able to sniff and or migrate that to a real machine? Um, well, I didn't migrate it to a real machine, but sniffing is not a problem at all. Um, as I indicated, there are even special callback hooks in the um, USB host driver that you can attach. This. You can write a small kernel module. Um, do I have another USB cable here? But anyway, no, they're busy with the screen. I cannot show it here. But anyway, um, there's two exported global symbols, um, which is callback functions that avoid callback functions. So don't, they don't interact with, with the USB traffic at all. You can just register to them and you will get called for every USB packet to send or received on that channel. And I've written a small module that just prints case, print case hex dumps of that, and I've collected a number of hex dumps. And uh, I've, as I said, I've already indicated how to extract information on the number of incoming, I mean, the, the calling uh, number of, of incoming calls and stuff like that. Is the, uh, the, is the codec run on, the, the audio codec run on the uh, GSM processor, or is it run on, in, under Linux? It's run on the GSM processor, but you can configure. Basically, the audio routing is, again, another very complex thing in that system. But you, you, can, um, 
you can transmit audio from the uh, from the Linux to the GSM part. So, but in in the default um, in the default uh, configuration, the codec uh, runs on uh, the GSM part. So the way how this works is actually that the audio is is um, digitized in the PCAP, which is the support uh, a support uh, a chip, and then it is uh, the serial uh, interface which interconnects both the application processor and the baseband processor and this um, this support uh, processor. And the GSM uh, uh, processor doesn't really care where it comes from because it's, it's just serial interface. So you can also send audio data from the from the application processor. Um. Oh, by the way, um, the phone actually has a, a SIP daemon installed. It's just not activated. Um. So it ships with SIP support, including video SIP support. Um, what, would you, um, what would you think that it needs at, at, um, as a fault to um, uh, support cryptographed telephone calls so that you um, encrypt the air interface of the GSM because GSM is breakable, so you want to have some crypto to, to back your uh, very important calls to your secretary or to your girlfriend. And how, mu how much effort would it be? What do you think? It's certainly doable. Um, if you just want to go for that, you can run the existing kernel. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can manage these modifications, to do these modifications that are required without um, having to change too much of the system. But if you, if you think about security, then you want to replace all the stuff that's on the phone. Um, you want to run your own kernel. You don't want to run all the applications and the complex stuff that's running there. So you just want a very lean system. But uh, to getting back to the original question, I'm, I don't think it's, it's extremely difficult to, to do uh, encryption for that. Can you tap the audio? Because I it could be that the audio is connected to the uh, DSP in the GSM part. And so you could not uh, inter, um, tap it. Um, well, if you want to do crypto over GSM, it's my understanding that you would want to make a data call anyway. Because, uh, but, but uh, yes, you, well, you cannot tap directly into the audio, but the, uh, you can digitize the audio. So the audio is received by both the AP and the BP. And also, you can send from any of these. So as I said, there's this serial interconnection between the three chips, which you can use to pass audio back and forth. Okay, so because you, you would want to intercept it because if you make a data call, you are, um, um, you are, you are evil because they can see that you're making a data call. And so oh my if God. you make a voice call and that is encrypted, there you, you hear some noise, okay, they, they are at the river or somewhere. Um, I'm, I don't think you can do it in the, in the GSM. Um, you, I don't think you can make uh, encrypted voice calls using voice calls because... Uh, uh, as I said, the audio is un this uncompressed PCM audio going into the GSM chip, and then it gets compressed using the you know what is it a a AMR uh, a codec and and sent over the wire. So you cannot encrypt first and then uh, put it into an, an audio compression codec. It wouldn't work. Okay. So you, the only chance to do it is make a data call and uh, basically put the phone into uh, you know voice recorder mode. Um, and uh, record, I mean, get the PCM audio into the Linux uh, uh, PXA processor and um, uh, do whatever kind of software codec on there and then put it into GSM, uh, into GPRS or, or GSM data frames and, and transmit them. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yes, um, I think we still have problems with Norvia. Yeah, question, yes, please. Um, is there an easy way to to uh, edit the the uh, flash file systems? Because I have to change a little bit. <laughs> uh, yes, the, 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 there is no easy way to change the flash file system because they are um, well, apart. Most of the partitions, in, in, especially the root file system, they are on read-only flash file systems, so you cannot modify them on, on the fly. So you need to make a copy on the PC, do whatever changes you want, and then transfer them back to the device and then write them, for example, into def, MTD, whatever. But 
this is possible. This is do. possible, yes. Um, without uh, special tools. Uh, well, uh, well, <laughs> with freely available free software tools that we have now in the OpenEasyX project, yes. Okay. Um, nice. Because, well, um, the main issue is that um, the memory management unit of the uh, application processor is configured in a way to protect um, accidental, in quotes, um, overwriting or modification of, uh, for example, the kernel and the bootloader uh, memory range. But um, an interesting fellow has written a hack that taps into the APM callbacks because when the phone comes back from deep sleep, you have a slight time window in which you can reset those bits and remove the, the, the write protection from those memory areas. And then later on, you can, you can flash them. But that, that's a really cool hack. Um, Okay, we have serious problems. Maybe you want to. Okay. Um, we got no slides. Yeah, just just go ahead. Um, okay. With no slides. Okay. Good evening. My name is Martin Schaller. I am developer of the Xenadux project, which tries to port Linux to pocket PC phones. The goal of the project is similar to OpenEasyX to get a free Linux phone, uh, but the approach is different. We take a PPC device as a basis. Unfortunately, the slides don't work, so I have to trust you to a talk. So why do we want uh, Linux on pocket PC phones instead of just taking uh, already a Linux phone? The hardware is quite affordable and available. Nearly every network operator has, has the devices in, in his store. And they are usually quite well equipped. Uh, for example, this one, it's a HTC Blue Angel. It has wireless LAN, Bluetooth, um, a relatively large display and quadband GSM. So are useful tools for reverse engineering for pocket PC phones, for example, Pirate, it's a handheld reverse engineering tool, which also serves as bootloader. And why we want Linux? Because it's more flexible than Windows, and it gives complete control over the hardware. For example, um, the, on the Windows it's quite troublesome to get the camera working with programs. You can only use it from the GUI. Um, we currently support about five devices. It's the H HTC Blue Angel, HTC Himalaya, Himalaya HTC Wallaby, and HTC Universal and Magazine. They're all manufactured by HTC, a Taiwan company which claims to make world-class Windows C solutions. The Blue Angel has a X-scale PXA, 263 with 400 megahertz, 128 megabyte RAM, 23, uh, 30, 32 megabytes PXA flash, and 64 megabytes disk on chip. This on chip is kind of a SD card on board. It has an SD SDIO card slot, uh, 240.320 uh, accelerated touchscreen LCD, Bluetooth and wireless LAN, uh, VGA camera, and quadband GSM. And it also has a keyboard which can be pulled out. Some of the things we used to get Linux working. First, uh, it was Softgun, an ARM emulator, original uh, designed for a national semiconductor development board. Um, unfortunately, it is not powerful enough to boot Windows, but the bootloader works quite well. And since most of the drivers are also integrated into the bootloader, um, it is quite comfortable to get 
a look what I/O ports are accessed and what values are written to it. Next thing is HeyRed, it's a handheld reverse engineering tool. Um, it is a tool where you can uh, boot Linux with it and uh, also make virtual physical address con conversions and get some parameters from Windows like the frame buffer base address. Next thing is IDA Pro, an intelligent disassembler. And since the drivers are very well separated, each into its own DLL, it is quite useful to take a look what happens inside the driver. So and of course, lots of trial and error, like flip this bit, what happens, and experience of code from other projects. Current status of the device, what works very well is the touch screen and the SD card interface. Unfortunately, no SDIO yet because um, there, is no, there are no Linux drivers for SDIO cards and there is no SDIO infrastructure in the kernel. The audio works mostly. Um, headset and Bluetooth audio uh, is not working. Um, GSM voice works. You can make and receive calls. GPS CST is working, but the communication is split into two parts. There is first a UART which uh, transfers the commands, and there is a second UART, actually a dual part of RAM, which transfers data. The keyboard works, um, except for um, some keys where the key map is missing an entry. Um, USB works. Serial connection works, Bluetooth works. Problematic is uh, still the battery status because it's not really easy to get. Here that does not yet work. Same for VLAN. The device has an ACX100 VLAN chip from Texas Instruments. Um, there is existing an open source driver, but unfortunately um, the chip is connected via PCMCA on the device and the driver is missing a card service. The camera does not yet work. It is connected via e square c and SPE and um, probably also with a bus to the video chip. And quite problematic is also disk on chip. There exists no open source driver since it is a GS3 chip. And um, the only implementation I know is the Motorola driver, but this is for kernel 2.4. We use kernel 2.6. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to write a layer that makes the 2.4 module compatible for the 2.6 kernel. Um, we are use, currently using a, a kernel uh, 2.6.12. Nearly everything is compiled as a module. Booting is done from SD card via Herod. Um, the SD card contains two partitions, one small VFAT for the kernel init RD bootloader and an autorun exe, which allows to boot Linux as soon as the SD card is inserted. And the second partition is an X3 file system, which is root, used for root. We are using the standard glibc and pusibox for the system, and if, if you install Linux, Windows will be still on the device, so you just have to make a hard reset and you get your Windows back, but your, all your data will be lost since it is stored in the RAM and, and Linux overrides the RAM. Uh, we use GPE as GUI because it's a bit more flexible than OP. It uses uh, SQLite for data storage and Dbus for communications. OP might also work, but it will take some work to get it fixed. The phone application is called Communicator. It allows to make and receive calls, write and receive SMS, and take a look into the call list. 
there is some interaction between the contacts application and the phone application. So uh, incoming call gets looked up into the address book and you can also uh, dial a number from the address book. Things left to do, um, we have to make an installation system which makes it easier for people to install Linux. The goal is to download one exe file, call it and get Linux installed. There are quite, uh, still some bugs. The suspend car power consumption is too high. We are currently using uh, 10 milliampers in standby. Windows only uses four. Uh, the usability uh, should be improved. It is sometimes quite hard to get the uh, thing done you want to do. Okay, further information about the project. Um, you get can, can get some information at www.handhelds.org and at www.xda.developers.com. Also, there is a project page on SourceForge called Xanadox. Developing takes, part, uh, takes place mostly on the IRC channel HTC Blue Angel on IRC Freenode.net. The project could still use some help, so we are looking for developers, supporters, and maybe sponsors which uh, need a special feature and are willing to give some money or hardware in exchange. So that's for the HTC Blue Angel. Thanks for listening. <laughs>